two fruit flies, one male, one female. This culture bottle will be their home, and this mixture of cornmeal and syrup will be their food. The growth of the population of fruit flies in the bottle will be plotted on a graph. The x-axis will represent time and days. The y-axis will represent the number of flies in the culture bottle. On day one, the fruit fly population in the culture jar is two. On the fifth day, the first census is taken. There are still only two flies in the bottle. On the ninth day, the fruit fly population has risen by one. Another census is taken on the twelfth day. Now there are 52 flies in the bottle. On the 16th day, the fruit fly population has reached 146. A census taken on the 18th day reveals that the fruit fly population has dropped by seven flies. There are 139 flies now. On the 20th day, the population is up to 158. Two days later, the population has dropped to 135 flies. On the 25th day, the population has dropped to 43 flies. By the 30th day, there are no live flies in the bottle. As the food supply and the environment became contaminated, the population of fruit flies at first leveled off in a state of equilibrium. Finally, the fruit flies died, all of them. Now the experiment will be repeated. But this time, the fruit flies world will be four times bigger than before. The curve is much steeper, its upper limits much higher. But again, the population reaches a state of equilibrium and finally dies out. It seems clear that these populations had natural limits and that these limits were set by the environment in which the population was expanding. We can watch the growth of a population of bacteria using the time-lapse camera, which will show us 48 hours of time in 10 seconds. The growth curve looks like this. The bacteria population has reached a state of equilibrium. The supply of food around each colony has been contaminated by waste products from the colony itself. Eventually, all the bacteria will die out. The two field mice in this box 
a male and a female, will be supplied with all the food and water they want. And so will their descendants. Despite the unlimited food supply, the population reaches a state of equilibrium. If the size of the environment is increased and the food supply remains unlimited, the population rises. But again, the population reaches a state of equilibrium. The environments for populations in nature are complex and interrelated. As a simplified example, consider the population of rabbits, the population of hawks, and the supply of grass in this valley. After a period of heavy rain, the supply of grass increases. With more grass to eat, the rabbit population grows. With more rabbits available, the hawk population begins to grow. As the rabbit population continues to grow, the supply of grass begins to go down. As the population of hawks increases, the rabbit population declines. The decreasing grass supply also lowers the rabbit population. And so it goes. As the rabbit population goes down, there is less food for the hawks, and the hawk population is reduced. Now, with fewer rabbits to eat grass, the supply of grass goes up. The increased grass supply can support more rabbits, and the increased rabbit supply leads to an increase in the hawk population, and the cycle repeats itself. The combinations of factors which affect population growth in nature are limitless, and their interrelations are very complex. The supply of food, the presence or absence of natural enemies, the degree of crowding, disease, pollution of air or water, sufficient rainfall or the lack of it, competition between species. All these things and many more can act as limits to population growth. The members of this tribe of Australian Aborigines are food gatherers. Their method of getting food is not very different from that of many other animals. And, like other animals, they are very dependent on the environment in which they live. The population of this tribe is in a state of equilibrium. On the average, the number of births in a given period of time is equal to the number of deaths. The main environmental factor that limits the population growth of this tribe is the amount of food available for gathering within the area of tribal control. It has been estimated that if all the world were inhabited by human beings who depended on food gathering for their existence, then the maximum human world population would be about 10 million people. The present population of the world is more than 300 times that figure. The explanation is that man, better than any other animal, has learned to adapt and control his environment. Man's success at shaping his environment to his own needs has radically affected the curve of his population growth. Man first appeared on Earth about a million years ago. His population is now more than three billion. So you might expect the growth curve for human population to look like this. Actually, the curve doesn't look like that at all. Man first appeared on his population growth 
must have followed a curve similar to the ones we have seen plotted for fruit flies or for mice. The curve leveled off under the controlling limits of the environment, of which probably the most important was the amount of food available. Lacking census figures, we can only make estimates on the basis of anthropological evidence, but it seems likely that for hundreds of thousands of years, the curve hovered in equilibrium around an upper limit of only two or three million. Then, before the dawn of recorded history, man learned to cultivate the plants that were most useful for food and to domesticate and breed the animals that were most valuable to him. By forcing the production of more food, man had changed his environment to suit his own needs. With the advent of this agricultural revolution, the population curve turned up. More food meant more people. Towns and cities grew because no longer did everyone have to spend all his time in search of food. Men had time for studies of the arts and sciences. As agricultural methods improved and as more land was farmed, energy production increased and world population continued to grow, but to grow slowly, limited by high death rates, the results of war and disease. By 1700, based on estimates made from the crude census figures available, world human population had reached the half billion mark. With the invention of the steam engine, the Industrial Revolution began in England in the 1700s. One machine led quickly to the invention of others, and life changed radically in many parts of the world. The population curve turned sharply upwards. New machines and methods led to more productive agriculture, to a more fluid economy in which food could easily be shipped to the places it was needed, to new methods of sanitation and new skills in medicine, which combined to radically lower the death rate in many parts of the world. By 1960, spurred by these advances in the control of the environment, world population had passed the three billion mark. After a long, slow start, human population has reached a state of growth that has been labeled an explosion. Take an average thousand people in the United States today. In the course of a year, out of that thousand, about nine people will die. But in the same year, to those thousand people, about 23 babies will be born. The population has increased by 14, or by one and four tenths percent. At this annual rate of growth, the population of the United States will double in less than 50 years. Out of an average thousand Africans, each year 25 will die. But in the same year, 45 babies will be born. The net yearly increase is 2%, and at that rate, the population in Africa will double in about 35 years. In Mexico, out of a thousand people, an average of 13 will die in the course of a year. But there will be 46 births. This results in a net annual increase of three and three tenths percent, which will double the population in slightly more than 20 years. When you see someone sick, you must help him. Advanced public health methods have been introduced in underdeveloped countries like India. Death rates go down, resulting in an increase in population. And unless the food supply is increased at the same time, the result of that is starvation. In Mexico, United States help was given over a 20-year period to modernize agricultural techniques. The result was a remarkable 80% increase in food production. However, over the same period of time, the Mexican population also increased by very nearly 80%. At the end of 20 years, people still did not have enough to eat. Increased food production alone did not solve the problem. It takes energy to support any population. Energy in the form of food, and in the case of an industrialized society, energy for the machines that produce food. There are still untapped oil resources under the oceans. Energy from the sun may someday be used to run machines that produce food. 
there is still unused land which can be farmed. And there are sources of food which have been utilized only experimentally, such as the collection and cultivation of algae from the sea. But the same scientific skills which preserve and lengthen human life also contribute to the population increase. No matter how fast science advances, population growth will always be ahead of it until the day comes when limiting factors of the environment, either natural or man-made, must cause the curve to turn. Will the limiting factors be increasing starvation, raging epidemic disease as a result of overcrowding, or global wars caused by the pressure of too many people living in too little space. Children growing up today may see these things happen unless we face the problem and resolve it. How can we turn our population curve and guarantee that coming generations will have enough room to live in and enough to eat? <laughs>